Today, I want to share with you some Docker Compose tricks that I wish I would have known from the very beginning. And if you're running Docker in your home lab or even production environments, you're probably already using Docker Compose code to manage your containers and your container stacks. But there are some little tips and best practices that will make your life a lot easier. Your environment will be a lot cleaner and your deployments will be more reliable. So let's dive in and sharpen our skills with Docker Compose. The first tip that I have for you is use a project directory structure. Now, one of the first things that I learned the hard way is to keep your Docker Compose projects organized in their own directories. In fact, when I first started, I just dumped all of my container configs for every project into one folder, and that turned out to be absolute chaos. Things would break, I couldn't find what belonged to what, and it got confusing very fast. Now, though, I take a much more structured approach. I create a parent folder located somewhere like the home directory of my Linux admin account, and I create that parent home lab services directory. And then underneath the home lab services directory and inside that, I make subfolders for each project. And I name those very intuitively so I know exactly what the project is. And then in each folder, I can have those Docker Compose files that are needed for that specific project. And this makes things so much easier. In fact, let me give you a tour of one of my Docker Compose hosts and just give you a lay of the land of how this folder structure looks. Okay, so I'm remoted into one of my Docker hosts that I have running here in the home lab, CL Docker Test 3, and I just wanted to show you guys the directory structure that I have configured. As you can see in my home directory, if I list out the directories here, I have a parent directory called Home Lab Services, and this is what I normally create on all of my Docker container hosts. Home Lab Services, and then underneath Home Lab Services, what I have is the child folders, all of the services that I'm running here. So you can see things like my homegrown Docker dashboard, which I've got a post about, you see Komodo, you see Monitor, uh, Monitoring Stack, I've got Grafana, I've got some other resources in here, InfluxDB, the TickStack uh, Grafana Docker folder, I've got a tick stack. You can tell I was playing around with a lot of uh, monitoring projects on this particular Docker host. Uh, but as you can see, this is the structure that I typically try to keep with. And if I take out the dash D, that will show you all of the files inside the folders. So you can kind of get an idea of how this plays out even more. Under Docker dashboard, you can see some configuration files, my Docker file here, the monitor stack, you can see my Docker compose.yaml file. And if we scroll on down, Docker compose.yaml, a environment variables file here, all of the child files and resources that are created in these directories. So I just wanted to give you a perspective of how I organize things. And this has worked out really well for me in the home lab, as well as production environments with standalone. Uh, single Docker host, organizing your projects and production apps or what have you, services, APIs, whatever you're spinning up in Docker, organizing those this way with that parent folder, whatever that is for me in the home lab. Of course, it's home lab services. You could have prod services or whatever you want to call it. And then having those child projects underneath that parent folder is a great way to organize your projects in Docker Compose. Now, the next tip that I have for you is to keep configuration values out of your Docker Compose files. It's very easy to hard code values like passwords, ports, or database names directly into your Compose file. And this is okay when you're playing around and you're just trying to get something up and running quickly, but don't leave it that way. It's tempting, but it will bite you later, and it's actually a security risk. What do you need to do instead? Well, spin yourself up a .env file, and this is an environment variables file that Docker Compose can use to read in those values that you would otherwise hard code inside your Docker Compose YAML file. There's another benefit to this as well. When you have that separate file outside of the Docker Compose, 
then you can make sure that that file is in your git ignore file so that you're not committing those secrets or sensitive values into your source and you can keep all of those things separated from your docker compose code which makes things easier and then you can simply change the env file if any of those values needs to change. That's something that I really like to do. So let's see what an env file looks like and how you would use one. So now let's look at a Docker Compose file that makes use of an env file. What I have here is a docker-compose.yaml file on the left and then a env file over on the right hand side of the Visual Studio Code window. And this is fairly intuitive. It's not that difficult to see what's happening here. So basically we've got a variable placeholder that is named MySQL root password. And then in our env file, we have the equivalent with the contents of that variable. So think of this like your secrets file that is read in to the docker compose.yaml file. Now, could we easily uh, do something like this? Absolutely. We could hard code those passwords, but this is what we're trying to get across in this Docker Compose tip is that when you want to do things the right way, especially for production environments, you want to use these environment variables and then you want to have a .env file that you can, of course, add to your git ignore file so that this never gets committed to source. You only have your compose file that reads from that env file. So you're never committing things like passwords or other secrets in your source control. So hopefully this gives you a good idea, at least in a very simple example of a MySQL container reading in some simple environment variables from a .env file. The next tip is using Docker labels. Now, as it turns out, labels aren't just for things like traffic or other reverse proxies that make use of them. And if you're like me, traffic was probably the only exposure that you had to labels when you first got started and were playing around. However, labels are also good for organizing and filtering your containers. Let me show you an example of what labels can do for you. So next, let's look at Docker labels. And Docker labels can be extremely powerful. And we've probably seen these with things like traffic, which relies on labels to properly route traffic or classify ingress traffic to a container. However, labels are useful outside of something like traffic. And I wanna show you just in a simple example of Docker Compose code, what we can do. We can add labels, for instance, with this tiny Nginx latest container, and we can add labels like this. We can say this is Nginx demo. We can say the environment equals lab. The owner equals Brandon. So what can I do with that? Once I label a container in my Docker Compose code, then I can do things like this. Let's filter all of the containers with a label of lab. Or if you want to stop specific containers related to a specific project, you can do something like Docker PS, the dash Q and filter option label equals environment lab. And then we can pipe that to something like Docker stop. We can also do things like filtering the owner label. We can say, I want to remove all of the containers that have the label of owner equal to Brandon. And then finally, we can do things like restarting certain containers. For instance, Docker PS using that dash Q and filter of project Nginx demo, and then we can restart those containers. So lots of really cool things that you can do with these Docker Compose labels. Next, use health checks and integrate those as part of your Docker Compose code. Health checks are really underrated and they make sure that your containers don't report as healthy until they're actually ready based on a health check that you define. Is a port available? Is a page reachable if this container hosts web services? And many, many other health checks that you can look for in your Docker Compose. And then that way, when Docker Compose brings up those services, the health check will continue to check for those health checks to be true, or it will mark the container as unhealthy. And that gives you an idea of something is not exactly right if the service is not truly available, even though the container is up and running. And let me show you what some of those health checks look like and how you integrate this into your Docker Compose code. 
health checks are extremely powerful in your Docker Compose. And they give you a way as a sanity check to say this container, even though it's running, it shows to be running when I run a Docker PS, it is actually healthy. What does this health check allow us to do? Well, I've got a simple example again with Nginx that we know is a web server. So what kind of health check would make sense here? A health check statement in our Docker Compose, and this is how you format it, just health check with a colon, and then we've got our test stanza here, and we're telling it to use a simple command to curl and see if we get something at port 80. As we know, this is what is going to be exposed and accessible locally to Docker itself. And you can define things like the interval at which it checks, the timeout that it's going to use to say, okay, this is not available, and how many times it's going to retry. Also, we've got a start period. How long does it wait before it runs the health check? So you've got a lot of ways to really craft these health checks in such a way that they're meaningful and they provide value. Next is using Docker Compose profiles. Now profiles may not be something you've ever heard about with Docker Compose, and let's shed some light on that. Docker Compose profiles let you enable or disable parts of your stack without editing any files. And this can be really helpful for things like dev test staging environments and pivoting between one environment or another using those composed profiles. Let's see what those look like. So Docker Compose profiles are definitely a trick and a tip that I want to make use of myself more as well. It's easy to use and easy to implement. So in your Docker Compose file, you simply append the profile that you want to call it to the container. So as you can see, I've got profiles dev uh, appended to our DB container, which is MySQL. And then I've got dev also appended to our Redis cache. The profile dev contains both of these containers. Now, if I just simply run Docker Compose up-d like we normally do, only the Nginx container will start. And the reason for that is we have not specified the profile of dev. If we only want to start our Nginx container, we can just simply do the up-d. However, if we want to start all of these containers, we can also use this command, docker compose profile dev up-d. And that basically does the same thing as this, except it also adds our profile of dev containers. So all three of these containers will start if we also append this profile dev up-d. Now the next tip is organizing multi-configs and overrides. Docker Compose supports multi-file setups, which is really, really great for separating dev and prod configs between the two and it allows you to work with those uh, environments much more efficiently. Let's see what these multi-config environments look like in Docker Compose. This one I think is really, really cool. It's the overrides file, and it does some really special purpose things when it comes to bringing up services. So you're going to create your normal docker-compose.yaml file to bring up your base services, but then with the docker-compose.override.yaml file, this file merges or overrides settings. So merges or overrides those settings. In this case, it's going to override those settings because we have both of the files reference the service app. And so it's going to look at this overrides file and that file is going to override the settings of our base docker-compose file. Now, if we had different services that we wanted to add to these base services, then we can also use this docker file, this override file to add services. So it's either an override or a merge together of services if there are not conflicting services in the files, it merges, but anything that conflicts, the docker-compose override file will take precedence. And you can see this in our explicit docker-compose 
uh, command that we're showing here. This part of the command is basically implied. So you don't have to put this first dash F docker dash compose dot YAML file. As we know, if you just simply run a docker compose up dash D, if you have a docker dash compose dot YAML file in that same directory, it assumes that and it's going to read, read from that file. But I just put this in here explicitly to just help to see exactly what's going on in this scenario. So docker compose again, with this implied docker dash compose or explicit with a dash f but then you pass in the dash f and then your docker dash compose dot override file and so this file will either override what's in this file or it will merge additional settings. This is also good for a scenario, let's say you have a set of base settings that you want containers to have, maybe volume locations, maybe certain things like that, and you simply want to layer on top of those common settings, additional settings perhaps, that you want to instantiate differently than are defined in your docker-compose file. So there you have it, Docker Compose tricks that I wish I knew sooner. From using .env files and labels to profiles, health checks, and version control, you can take control of your Docker Compose game and take it to the next level. Now, if you found this video helpful, please do give it a like. Let me know in the comments what your favorite Docker Compose trick is. Maybe it's something we didn't list in my list for this video and I would love to learn from you all. So thanks for watching. Do stay safe out there. Keep on home labbing, and I will see you in the next video.